The conventional treatment for severe aortic stenosis has um, until recently been uh, uh, cardiothoracic surgery, open heart surgery to replace the aortic valve with a biological or mechanical prosthesis. Um, it is apparent, however, that anywhere between 30 to 60% of patients who have symptomatic aortic stenosis who would uh, be considered for this treatment um, aren't eligible, and they aren't eligible for various reasons. They aren't referred by their uh, physicians because they're deemed to be unsuitable. They are uh, alternatively declined by surgeons because they're perceived to be at too high risk for this life-saving treatment. So there is a large unmet need. And this unmet need really sparked the development of transcatheter heart valve technology applied to the aortic valve. The person to, who is really credited with the uh, discovery and development of uh, transcatheter heart valve technology and TAVI is Henning Andersen, a cardiologist from Denmark, who uh, developed the concept and fashioned a uh, prosthesis using a, a wire and a porcine pericardial, a porcine aortic valve, and tested the concept in, in animal models and, and found that it worked. Um, Henning didn't take it further, however. He sold the intellectual property rights to a, uh, a, uh, another cardiologist, Alan Cribier, who took this forward and um, with Edwards Life Sciences, a, a, a well-known um, uh, valve company, developed the Edwards Sapien valve. And um, the first uh, uh, Edwards Sapien valve was implanted in around uh, 2004. The valve has, has gone through a number of iterations and, uh, to what it, what it is now uh, and became really commercially available only as, as recently as 2008. And the Edward Sapien valve is a valve that I use here at the QE. There are, uh, at this point in time, only two commercially available transcatheter heart valves for the aortic valve, the Edward Sapien valve um, and the core valve. They are the only two, although there are many, many more in development. So what is the evidence um, supporting use of the Edward Sapien valve aortic, symptomatic aortic stenosis? Um, it really stems from two uh, randomised controlled trials of partner, cohorts A and B, where the valve was compared uh, in the first study, uh, cohort B, with, con uh, with um, medical treatments, in other words, doing nothing. Um, and the second trial was compared with uh, high-risk surgeries in patients who were eligible for high-risk surgery. So in cohort uh, B, where it's compared with medical therapy, the mortality at one year in the medical treated arm, so in other words doing nothing, um, was about 50%. So one in two of those patients was dead at one year with conventional treatment. And this mortality was reduced to around 30% in the group who underwent TAVI with the Edward Sapien valve. So that's a 20% absolute reduction in mortality, which is a very large, clinically significant benefit. In the study that compared it with high-risk surgery partner cohort A, um, there was uh, uh, no difference in mortality at one year, which is what one would expect. But the TAVI cohort enjoyed a much shorter hospital stay, which is again what we'd expect with a, um, a minimally invasive technology. So it showed its superiority, obviously, compared with medical therapy and showed that it was at least as good as conventional surgery if conventional surgery was, was, was eligible, uh, was feasible. So who exactly are we undertaking TAVI in today in the United Kingdom and elsewhere? The current guidelines uh, for this country indicate that we are uh, able to implant the valve in patients who have severe symptomatic aortic stenosis who are deemed by a multidisciplinary, uh, multidisciplinary team to, to be unsuitable for conventional open heart surgery. And unsuitability may stem from um, severe comorbidities, which put them at very high risk for conventional surgery, or may stem from uh, situations which simply make them um, technically um, untreatable by conventional surgery, such as uh, very poor lungs, which means they can't be anaesthetised, or perhaps a porcelain aorta, which means that a surgeon can't cross-clamp the aorta. So uh, those are really the two, two, two criteria, but essentially it is patients who are deemed unsuitable for conventional surgery. Coming to the patient who we're going to treat today, um, she is a lady of 77 years of age who has a large number of comorbidities. 
uh, in the past she has undergone uh, transphenoidal hypophysectomy for a pituitary tumour, which she is now obviously uh, have been treated for and beyond that, and that was for acromegaly. Um, she has hypertension, she has coronary disease, and she underwent a mechanical mitral valve replacement in 2001 through a midline stenotomy. She doesn't have any bypass grafts. Um, she also has peripheral vascular disease and has undergone um, uh, angioplasty to her left uh, superficial femoral artery and I think also to her eye neck artery. Um, and she, until very recently, has been a, a, quite a heavy cigarette smoker. Five things that I undertake um, here for our screening process is a uh, CTA autogram to look at the vessels right from the um, superficial femoral artery uh, up to the uh, great arch. We undertake a coronary angiogram to look at the artery supplying the heart. We undertake a transesophageal echo to look at function of the left ventricle, assess valves, including the aortic valve, and to get a measurement, which I'll, I'll talk more about in a moment. We look at the carotids and we also undertake spirometry. So we have a five point um, investigation. And then with that data, we sit down in the MDT and decide uh, whether or not the patient should, how they should best be managed. And the options are that they um, be considered for conventional surgery if you think that's appropriate. It may be that we uh, deem them suitable for TAVI, but some people are really not suitable for anything, and so some people are left with medical therapy. So these are the three possible outcomes from an MDT discussion. How do we go about sizing what are the sizes of the Edward Sapien valve? At this current point in time, there are three valve sizes, a 23 millimeter valve, a 26 millimeter valve, and 29 millimeter valve. The way to, that we size um, uh, a particular prosthesis for an individual is based on their annulus measurements. Now, the annulus, um, the aortic valve annulus, has been recognized uh, to be in many patients an ovoid structure and um, therefore that poses problems for any 2D uh, measurement. The way that the analysis is measured is either by echocardiography or by a CT scan. And there is a considerable debate at the moment really about which of these um, is, is the best modality. Because it's a 3D structure, I think it's very important that obviously you undertake a, a 3D imaging assessment. For an annulus of 23 millimeters, we would ordinarily select a 26 millimeter valve, which will give us enough um, that will mean that the valve is well seated and hopefully will give us enough seal so that we minimize paravalve leak. Because the, uh, what you want to do is obviously have a valve that is that is not going to migrate. So if it's not if it's if it's if it's undersized relative to the annulus, then obviously it can either dislodge into the ventricle or dislodge into the aorta, which clearly it's not good for anyone and um, if, the, if, it's, if, it, if, if the seal is not good then what we're going to clearly get is, is leak around the valve which will lead to aortic insufficiency and um, from the data that is available we know that this is a driver, a potential driver for mortality so we are doing what we can to minimize paravalve leak. So. I, I, you know, it's an incredibly important part of the assessment to get accurate analysis measurements and to then uh, predicate your valve uh, selection based on that. So uh, once again, this must be done either, with, with, ideally with the 3D measurement, be it um, 3D TOE or um, CT measurements. Uh, institutions really have to decide what they think is best. The evidence out there suggests um, that um, Either modality is 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 is, uh, is satisfactory, and that they lead to uh, similar valve sizing. So I think it's just one of those two. So this is a rendered uh, image of her um, uh, uh, taken from her CTA autogram, and uh, what we can see here is that the white patches show calcification. Now, this is really we, we're looking at this really just to see what the anatomy of her vessels is with respect to where the bifurcation of the common femoral lies relative to the femoral uh, head and also to look at tortuosity of both the um, common iliac, um, the external iliac and also of the uh, abdominal aorta and um, of the ascending aorta. 
And what we will do then is to carefully look through the cross sections looking for uh, calcification, um, uh, looking at the diameter of the vessel and we will decide then really what is the optimal access route for an individual. So once we've decided what valve we need, we now need to decide what access. And if iliofemoral vessels and the aorta are satisfactory in calibre um, and anatomy, then we will preferentially treat a patient through access um, via the leg arteries. But if they are unsuitable, then we need to select an alternative access. And that alternative access, with the Edward Sapien valve at least, is either via a transapical implant, which involves a small incision through the chest wall, or um, uh, uh, ideal, more ideal perhaps now is uh, through a um, is through the aorta directly through the aorta, and this can be achieved either through a small upper median stenotomy or a right thoracotomy, and there are uh, certainly advantages to. Uh, implanting the valve via a trans route as compared with a trans route.